Hi everybody. My name is Justin Caffrey and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to speak with you all today. I want to talk to you today about authenticity. About the capacity just to be ourselves and how impactful being ourselves can be on the outcomes in respect to our businesses, our personal lives, and negotiations. So the whole idea of how best to influence people within your business. And within the spa industry, I understand that there's a great need to be able to have the right tools to create influence within the general managers of the hotels that many of you work with or other stakeholders within your business. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the benefits that I've learned around authenticity, but also the whole idea of how best to lean in and out of the feminine and the masculine. Two areas that we all work within, but sometimes we can lean a little bit close to one and too far from the other. So a bit of background on me and why I'm here speaking to you. What value can I add to you and your business? My background is an entrepreneur in the private equity world. I built my first business at 23 and that was after four really successful years in banking in the city of London. Um, I was very lucky at a very young age to build and run very successful teams within the bank and then subsequently build and run and sell my own businesses. And that meant huge amounts of success, drive and determination. A capacity to create value, to understand the financial markets and to be able to trade and sell businesses, which of course is great in the context of accumulating material assets and all the things that from an aspirational point of view people are looking to achieve. So I kind of looked like I had it all figured out. Built and sold companies, made money, had success, had the beautiful houses, the nice cars, etc. I got married, I had a child, and life appeared to be, for all intents and purposes, perfect. But then, in January 2011, my second son, Joshua, died. And that was after a prolonged 11 month illness where we fought our biggest fight to try and sustain his life, to try and maintain him within our family. Because up until that point, I firmly believed that most of everything that I would want in life, I could get by just pushing hard. But all of a sudden, here's an event that I can't push hard within. The outcome is determined by variables that are outside of my control. And when I saw Joshua drawing his last breath whilst in the arms of my wife, I realized that was our white flag moment. We lost that fight. And I knew that from that point onwards, life would never be the same. But there's a process that one must follow after such a loss. And that's grief. I didn't step inside it. My wife did. She grieved. She walked for days and months in the mountains beside where we lived with our dogs. She connected deeply to her grief. I buried it. I wanted to move away from the vulnerability and the emotion that I'd felt over those previous 11 months. I'd had enough of that part of my life. 
I'd had a good 11 months where we were close as a family, where I grieved and cried for the life that I used to have. But I built a resilience around the fact that I felt that we could fight hard enough to keep Joshua within our family. But I didn't have any more time to grieve. I wanted to go out and flex my muscles to the world. Show people that I was back as a business builder, as an entrepreneur, as a driven, determined, successful human being. And to do that, I needed to suppress the tears, the fears, the doubts, the guilt, the anger. I needed to step past the loss of my son. My other son had lost his brother. My wife had lost her second child. And tragically, my own parents had lost their second grandchild because my sister had lost a toddler only a few years prior to the Joshua's death. But I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on building a new business, capitalizing in new markets. And within weeks of Joshua's funeral, I was sitting in front of regulators in the European Union, seeking new licenses in the investment and financial markets. And if you don't process your emotions, you have to put them somewhere. So I put them somewhere, I suppress them deep inside me. And the energy that I felt that I needed most in that environment was masculinity. I didn't want to be vulnerable. I didn't want to be connected to empathy. And the last thing I wanted was sympathy. So I wanted to push deep inside my masculine energy, drive forward in the pursuit of I don't really know what, to be honest. But in my mind, I was pursuing something that was going to look different to anything I'd ever achieved before. But the further I ran away from my grief, the further I ran away from myself. And within three years, things began to unravel running a successful business. I had a great team of investors and shareholders, a fantastic board. We had offices in three countries. I was on 150 plus flights a year, working 16 hours a day, desperately determined to keep growing and delivering on promises that I'd made to my investors, to my shareholders. And in a really important meeting, I started to believe that I was having a heart attack or a stroke. But I brought some parties in from the Middle East and the US into this meeting and I needed to close a deal. So my mind works very simply. I need ink on these contracts no matter what. So I thought if I'm having a stroke or a heart attack, I might be able to just push through this and get everything signed and then get everybody out of the office and if there's a medical issue, I'll deal with it then. It even sounds crazy when I say it now. In time, I learned that was a panic attack. But can you believe at that moment with the masculine drive of energy pulsating through my body, I was in the kill or be killed environment didn't matter to me what it was. What mattered to me was closing the deal. After that, within the next three months, I really started to unravel. I really started to feel unwell. And my wife started to notice and I realized I needed to get some help. 
I'd come from a tragic background where working class family, my father was clinically depressed all the way through his life. He had electric shock treatment. He was institutionalized multiple times when I was a teenager and he was suicidal on several occasions. So I was running from that. And now I had to face into my darkest demons. I was lucky that I found a psychiatrist who had a great belief in Eastern psychology and Eastern philosophy. And within four or five months of therapy, I was in great shape. So much so that I realized, I want to do what you do. And I went off and I studied with him. And two and a half years into our studies, I also became a Buddhist. And now I specialized in Buddhist psychology and coaching people and leaders about how to be the most authentic version of themselves. How can they use the authentic approach in the context of their vulnerabilities, their drive, and their capacity to be a leader within their own truth, rather than a mask or a cover-up or a story that they believe they need to tell themselves, their stakeholders, or their staff. So I studied neuroscience and psychology, Eastern philosophy. I studied with Zen Buddhist monks in Japan. And then I completed the rigorous Yamabushi master training in the remote mystical mountains of Shonai in Japan. So that's all very interesting, right? But how does it help you? How does it help the spa industry? If you think about it, grief, empathy, and love are all feminine energies. I've pushed against them and refused to let them in. I wore a mask that hid my true self. I avoided vulnerability. I hid my authenticity. And that brought huge amount of stress and anxiety. And the studies in the last 20 years teach us all the time how well humans relate to authentic humans. We want to buy off people we believe in. We want to be around people that we can trust. We crave authentic relationships. In a world filled with virtual conferences and social media, the power of authenticity and connection can never be understated. So as I said, many of you need to influence your GMs and your stakeholders. And female leaders can often feel compelled to embrace the male energy. But when you embrace a different energy than the one that you have, and even if you're a male leader, and just like I did, you lean too far towards the masculine, you give up on the openness, you give up on your empathy, you give up on your compassion. And often we lose our capacity to be grounded and present as we move into that masculine energy. So when you use these other traits, is that really you? Is that the same person who plays with their children or their nephews and nieces? Is that the same person that's playful on a Friday night and Sunday morning? Because the more you can be the same person, the less energy you have to spend trying to remember who did I tell that person I was? Which mask am I wearing today? And we've all been sold this idea of fake it until you make it. Have you ever tried that on? It's great if you need it just for a five minute close to get over a hurdle and to get that job that you really want. But wow. 
Don't try leaning in to fake it until you make it for days, months, and years. Because it's not a way to build long lasting relationships. It's not a way to build trust. So what I'm saying to you today is that vulnerability and authenticity really are true superpowers. And I can speak from my own reality here. Because after I become a Buddhist, after I become a coach speaking about authenticity and intentionality and the power of embracing the femininity, I had an opportunity to participate in a private equity deal about 18 months ago. And I knew this was going to be different because I wanted to stay true to myself. So I did. And I offered myself forward when I was vulnerable to others to seek assistance. And within this deal, I had probably the least amount of interaction I've ever had. Maybe 35 phone calls and six meetings. And I turned a pound share investment into a million pound return for myself. And I sold my stake about 14 months later. In that transaction, the real me showed up every time. The real me negotiated with everybody. The real me built each one of those relationships. So what are those key traits within the femininity that are important in business? The capacity to be acceptant and accepting of others. A collegiate approach to building a team but a collegiate approach to building relationships with your stakeholders. Being approachable, giving people the confidence that they know they can come to you when they need to discuss something that's important. Remaining present. I meditate every day. I teach mindfulness as a business tool. But if we connect to the femininity, we are the embodiment of being present. It's when we can slow down and pay attention. It's that awareness. And as we slow down and pay attention and become present, we operate from instinct. Not a distracted, busy mind, but instinct. And if you think about what happens when we're trying to be something that we're not, when we're wearing multiple masks, when we're acting out of a masculine approach, when really that's not our natural selves. We become stressed, we become anxious. And the traits that we give to other people are an inability to stay focused and present, distracted at times, looking around, not able to hold eye contact, fidgeting. As humans, we associate these traits with something that's not great in the context of building relationships and negotiation. We associate these traits with people who lie. So the more authentic you are, the more present you are, the more you embrace the femininity within yourself as a female or male leader, the more you present the signals of somebody who can be trusted. So resilience and confidence and capacity to be yourself are all interconnected. I heard um, a lady speak who's a coach. Um, she's a, quite a significant leader in the whole world of coaching from a leadership perspective and executive coaching around the world, a lady called Jill Duca. But she said something really compelling once and she spoke about just after she had her first child she paid a visit to her sister, who was a nun, and she was in a nunnery, I think in, in Greece somewhere. 
And she'd spend a bit of time with her sister. And then an important call came in concerning her business. So she asked her sister to give her a moment while she took the call. She took the call. She spoke to their colleagues on the phone. When she hung up the call and turned back to her sister, her sister asked her, Why did you just sound like a man? And Jill was quite taken aback. But as it kind of settled in, she realized the difference in her voice, the intonation, the tonality of her voice, her delivery on that call, compared to who she was with her sister. She could just bear her soul and be herself. She didn't pay attention to that one. And then subsequently, sometime later, her daughter overheard her on the phone. And she asked her husband, why does mom sound angry when she's on the phone? And she started to realize that there was a connection to these points, sounding like a man sounding angry. She wasn't angry on the call that day. She was direct. But actually, was she being herself? Are we ourselves? Where is the best version of me? Where is the best version of you? It's inside your authentic self. It's not hidden behind a mask. So it took me to lose my son Joshua to realize that if I embrace myself, if I operate from my own authenticity, if I can find comfort in the power of embracing the balance within my human being, and we all have the balance of the masculine and feminine energy. And I don't spend time wearing multiple masks for multiple people. The energy that I save is huge. And more importantly, the capacity to be grounded and focused means that I'm thinking with my prefrontal cortex, my executive function is engaged. I wanna just offer a really simple little exercise for you to use when you're going into an interaction. Because often what'll happen is as you move towards that meeting with a stakeholder or a GM or whoever it'll be, as we move towards it, the heart rate rises, the body feels a bit tight. And what's actually happening is you're going into that fight, flight and freeze mode. So just before you start an important meeting, take an opportunity to take a breath. Huge amounts of neuroscience back this up in the context of penalty kick takers in soccer, field goal kickers in American football and, and, and rugby, special forces soldiers. We've got huge amounts of research on the power of the breath to slow down and create intentionality. So just before you start the meeting, Take in three nice, slow, deep inhales and exhales. It allows you to ground yourself and just say to yourself, I'm gonna be me in this meeting. I'm gonna speak from my truest self. And I think you'll be amazed what you can find in the context of outcomes. And it also helps you then be brave and ask the difficult questions. Lawyers often refer to the term an asked and answered question. You hear it in courtroom dramas. Much of the difficult questions that we face in our own lives about conversations with your GM or your stakeholders, I won't ask them that because I know they're gonna say this. When you take a breath, 
when you slow down and you're comfortable with being yourself and connecting to your vulnerability, just ask the question. Don't answer it in your own mind. Let the other person answer it. Let them speak to you, connect to you on a one-to-one -one basis. You'll be amazed what you can get by simply asking. So thank you. I hope some of this has been helpful, but I appeal to you most importantly, embrace the femininity within leadership. Rebalance yourself in the context of how you feel about the masculine and feminine. And if you're struggling with stress or anxiety, consider mindfulness and some meditation. It's a really beautiful power that allows you to connect into your most authentic self. So thank you very much for listening and I appreciate you having me here today.